a little bit as well. So I'd like to uh, welcome you to the welcome you to the Center for Clinical Epidemiology uh, and Evaluation, our annual lecture. Um, my name is Sterling Bryan. I'm the uh, director of the center. Uh, so thank you very much for uh, coming to uh, to the lecture, and we're looking forward to uh, learning about the learning healthcare system. Um, and so this year, uh, we, uh, we've invited uh, Dr. Robert uh, Reed um, uh, to give the, uh, the lecture. Uh, so Rob is the Medical Director of Research Translation at Group Health uh, in Seattle, uh, and is also a senior investigator in the Research Institute, uh, which is part of uh, Group Health. Uh, and many of you will know Rob uh, from his time uh, in Vancouver. Uh, he, he was faculty in, uh, in the Center for Health Services and Policy Research. Uh, so it's great to have Rob back uh, in Vancouver and to learn about uh, his experience in, uh, in healthcare in the, in the United States. Um, prior to Rob, uh, Rob's talk, um, Heather Davidson has uh, agreed to give some opening remarks to set the context uh, for British Columbia. Um, so Heather is the uh, uh, Assistant Deputy Minister in the Ministry of Health uh, in British Columbia. Uh, she has a doctorate in psychology from the University of Victoria um, and uh, has uh, in her file uh, many, many things, but including the strategy for patient-oriented research, which has uh, been dominating many people's lives for far too long, um, uh, and also the Academic Health Sciences Network, uh, which I think directly uh, relate to uh, the idea of trying to create um, a learning healthcare system in, uh, in British Columbia. So the, uh, the, the batting order is uh, once I uh, stop talking, then I'm going to ha hand over to, uh, to Heather Davidson. Uh, then Rob Reed will uh, give the, uh, the lecture. And then finally, um, uh, Rob McMaster, who's the director of the Vancouver Coastal Health Research Institute, uh, will give an initial response and facilitate some uh, questions. Uh, we do have uh, a reception immediately after the lecture, so there will be an opportunity for some further conversation uh, once the lecture is finished uh, over, uh, uh, over some food and uh, a glass of, uh, of juice uh, or water. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so don't get too uh, excited at the prospect, uh, uh, but the food, I'm told, is going to be very good. Um, good. Okay. So uh, moving, uh, moving uh, quickly on, I'll invite uh, Heather to come forward and I'll just put your slides up. Uh, and thank you for agreeing to, to provide some opening comments. So thanks, Sterling. Um, I want to say, first of all, that I'm here on behalf of our deputy. He was uh, wanted to come but was unable to attend today, so I have come in his, his stead. But he is very supportive of the whole idea of a, an, a, an, a, a learning system. And I'm, I'm very much looking forward to hearing um, Rob's talk about this. I also wanted to acknowledge, uh, Sterling mentioned the strategy for patient-oriented research. And Sterling has been very keenly involved in this and has played a real leadership role in developing the model that we have um, created for BC, which I'm not going to be talking about today. But um, if you want to know more about it, you can talk to Sterling or me during the reception as I sip my water or juice. Um, so what I was going to talk about today was the, the priorities for the healthcare system as have been defined by government, um, and it's called setting priorities for BC's healthcare system. Um, now I can see it. So there's, there's a document called setting priorities for BC healthcare system, which you can find on the web. And this was released in the um, spring of this year. And what it identifies are goals, priorities, strategies, and uh, key action areas for change in the healthcare system or development in the healthcare system over the next um, four or five years. It's based on the triple aim from the Institute for Healthcare Innovation in that we're trying to support the health and well being of, of BC citizens, deliver a, a, um, a responsive healthcare system. And also ensure value for money for taxpayers. So trying to achieve that triple aim is the, um, I think the the what we're all looking for. Those of us responsible for healthcare delivery, in terms of developing the strategy, this built on a previous strategy that had been, that had been initiated uh, in 2009 and 10, the change in innovation agenda, 
And um, we also did some analysis of the data that we have in the ministry in terms of population health and service utilization. And there was a lot of consultation with the health authorities, the physicians, nurses, the unions, um, and others to, to get their input as we, as we went forward. I would say that in, in general, if, you're, if you were aware of the Innovation and Change Agenda, many of the same themes are in the, the setting priorities document. We didn't totally fix everything in the first uh, four or five years of, of working on this. But what, what was quite different in the setting priorities document was really the how. Much more attention not just to what we're going to do, but how we're going to do it and how we're going to work with, with our stakeholders in the system to, to um, enable change and support change. So I know you won't be able to read this. I just wanted to quickly show you this. This is one of the key analytic tools we use in the ministry. What it shows um, a lot down here are different population segments. So we're able to, through um, using all of the administrative databases and clinical registries we have in the ministry, divide the population into unique 13 unique sectors based on how they how they have utilized healthcare in the past year. So you could be um, a frail elderly using residential care up to a healthy non-user of the system. And what it does is enable us to look at people, rather than dividing people by diseases, we, we have people in um, with chronic diseases in low complexity chronic diseases, medium complexity and high complexity. So basically everybody is divided into each, um, into one, one unique sector based on your highest use of healthcare. So what it shows down this axis, the blue shows the size of the population, that's the share of the population, and as we would hope to see, the majority of people are healthy with minor episodic healthcare needs or low complexity chronic disease. Very few people in the um, smaller portions of the population and some of the higher complexity, but this axis shows um, their healthcare utilization. And what you can see is people with Frail populations living in residential care are the highest user of healthcare services in the healthcare costs in the system. Um, people with with um, you know people here. I can just it's hard for me to read this myself. Yeah. So the cost for somebody who's a frail elderly in residential care is, is approximately fifty nine thousand dollars a year. Um, a, health, a healthy person with minor episodic needs is $310 a year in terms of annual cost for health care. So you can see that we need to pay attention to some of these populations with um, the frail elderly, people with serious mental health issues, um, and people with major uh, chronic diseases are the groups that are really targeted for um, priority and, and, and really need the system to change to support them better. We've also started using the same kind of matrix, and I don't have the data yet to show you here, but um, using these same target populations, looking at how the system is performing for these populations. So what are the healthcare? We have some sort of common measures we use to measure health system performance around ac accessibility, quality, those kinds of things. And you, you find the same, unfortunately, the people that have the highest needs are, are having the poorest health system performance. So it's a quite an interesting... Um, way to look at healthcare data. So this was one of the tools that we used to identify populations where we needed to pay attention. And the other, the other thing that I don't have on here is when you look at the populations that are the highest utilizers of healthcare services, they're also the populations that are growing the fastest. So um, another reason why we need to pay attention to those groups. Um, in addition to the strategic plan, you can also find on the, um, the ministry website our implementation plan, which is called um, well, uh, creatively enough, BC Health System Strategy Implementation. Um, and it basically describes what, how we plan to implement it, because I think that was what, what has often been missing as we've, you know, developed strategic plans. How are you actually going to try to drive the change on the ground where it actually matters? So there's three um, key areas of focus, and I'll just go through them each in a little bit in more detail. Patient-centered care, performance management, and cross-system focus areas. So patient-centered care, I mean, this is, you know, a motherhood statement, but the reality is we don't actually practice, and I think we know we don't have a very patient-centered system. It's, it's really divided by disease groups and for, in large part for providers' needs, not so much for patient needs. And if anybody's been a patient in the system, 
especially somebody with chronic disease, you will know that that's... Um, so we're trying to really more aggressively accelerate a, a, a change in culture around thinking about the patient and patient-centered care and what does that actually mean um, and working with providers who are the, the ones that are actually interfacing with patients to help us um, drive that shift so that it's more than just a motherhood statement that we make but it actually has meaning and, and patients can see that and patients are part of increasingly part of um, the discussions at a planning stage and and are getting much more involved in the system so they can actually speak for themselves and their voices can be heard. The performance management is really around, um, there's two, two parts to this. One is, is um, having an accountability framework that actually, um, so that we can actually monitor and track in a much more um, detailed way than we have in the past what how the system is performing we will have public reporting clarity of roles between the ministry and the health authorities and the providers and then accountability mechanisms which um, as we talked about uh, a little earlier today it's really important in a learning system that there actually is some accountability and then the other part of the performance management is while recognizing all, um, that there are some population groups or, or areas of service delivery where we need to make some really um, major transformations and pay major attention, we actually need to be having continuous improvement across all parts of the system in an ongoing way. It's not just about the big areas of change, but, but continuously improving um, how we're providing services and, and delivering care. And then the final one are these large areas that across the whole province we need to look at as focus areas, and they are around care in the community. Um, and really trying to provide more care in the community for some of the people with uh, complex diseases or frail elderly. Making sure people have access to medical treatments and procedures. We, we know that often, I mean, there's two big areas here. One is access to GPs and one is access to specialists. Um, both are, are problems in this, in this province and, and the delays in getting access to medical treatment can be... Um, is in impacting the, the quality of care that people are getting and their outcomes. Surgical treatments and procedures, we have long waiting lists for um, for some, some surgeries despite many years of efforts of trying to address waiting lists and much money trying to, to address this. So we really want to continue to work on making sure people have access to, to services. And then the hospital care one is really rethinking how we deliver hospital care. We, we originally, as you will know, hospitals were originally developed to provide, you know, episodic, urgent care, surgery. What the when you look in a hospital now, the majority of people that are there are seniors, and they are not there. They, you know, most surgeries are provided outpatient, and um, we do a really good job of, of episodic care, but. But how do we use hospitals? A huge investment that we've made in capital and human resources. Um, w how do we want hospitals to work going into the future, knowing that the needs of the population have changed over time? And then finally, residential care services for seniors. Um, the hope is that we will have people be able to remain in their homes, which we know most seniors want to do, but there will always be a population that need to go into residential care. We really want to improve the quality of care and the dignity of people that are, are living in residential care facilities. So those are the five areas that we intend to work on provincially with, with our health authorities and other, other providers. So that, in a quick overview, is our strategy. Part one, there's a number of enabling factors as well to the strategy, which I'm not going to go through, but one of the enablers is that we do create um, a learning system that is able to, to learn using evidence to inform the work that we do and also evaluating what we do and doing course correction. So, um, so we will listen with, with um, great interest to what, to what Rob has learned in the group health environment in the U.S. for what we might be able to, to, to apply here. So thank you very much. Great. Now for the main event. So, Dr. Dr. Reed. <clears throat> Um, thank you very much. It's just wonderful to be back in Vancouver and so see so many um, really good friends and acquaintances that I haven't seen in years and meeting so many new people. So uh, thank you, Sterling, for the, the invitation to speak to you. And um, 
Uh, I'm actually really flattered. This is an important lecture, um, and uh, I'm, I'm glad to be able to spend some time with you. Um, to, the goal today is actually to talk to you about a real provocative topic. It's going to be provocative, and I want you to, to think through it. Um, we're very early at the stage in this health system of, uh, that I work with around thinking through how to build it into a learning environment. But I, I certainly um, I'm going to uh, hopefully provoke you and really set the stage for some discussion and dialogue. Um, and I, I hope there's some mutual learning, too. I'd be remiss not to say of the, the quality of the work that is done at C2E2 and the Vancouver research community in general and what's happening at the ministry. Um, there is a, a stellar group of, of people in this province um, and uh, you should really recognize that the, the, the community here is really top-notch in the world, um, and, and I sincerely mean that. Um, so hold your clusters to the end. It's going to be a pretty rapid-fire uh, uh, discussion, and uh, I hopefully we'll um, move ahead. So uh, I just wanted to show you that I work for Group Health Cooperative. These are all my research funders, and I just realized with this slide I have way too many research projects underway. Um, <laughs> Um, and, but, but before I start, I'm, I'm sure that people are, have a bunch of questions, and I can, I can hear them under, under, your, under your breath. Um, and these are some of them. The ones, I mean, these are the questions, if I, were, if I were sitting in the audience listening to me, these are the questions that I would have. Um, so don't, doesn't the U.S. outspend all other countries in health care? Um, don't many U.S. citizens go with health care insurance? Don't uh, health care expenditures and quality problems just are pervasive and plague the U.S. healthcare system. Don't health outcomes lag uh, those in Canada? And if you answer it affirmative to all those questions, you would be correct. So then the next set of questions. So what we could we possibly <laughs> learn? Um, couldn't Sterling, Brian, really Sterling? Couldn't you find someone better? Um, wasn't there a, just a last minute can cancellation and I'm just a fill in? That could be true. And then finally, um, can, how can I sneak out with anybody noticing? And, and I won't tell on you, but I bet you it's going to be a little hard to sneak by everybody and get through that door. Uh, so, so this slide uh, I just wanted to start with, and this just exemplifies the problems in the United States around health care. This is a recent report by the Commonwealth Fund that ranks um, um, uh, countries uh, ac according to the, out the indicators that matter. Um, and, uh, and in almost every, every indicator, the U.S. healthcare system uh, ranks dead last. Um, and in particular, the cost, $8,500 per capita, 33% higher than the next available country. U.S. healthcare is bloated, inefficient, and inequitable. No doubt about it. Okay? Um, but what this, what this uh, graph doesn't tell you is the heterogeneity within the, health, within the U.S. healthcare system. Um, there are many things I would certainly not learn, probably the majority of things I would not learn uh, from, from the experiences in the United States, but there are um, some, uh, uh, some good examples and there are some learnings that, that you may take um, from uh, high-performing health systems. It's also interesting to see where Canada fits in this graph. Um, and it actually fits uh, right next to the U.S. in terms of health system performance. So there's a lot, lot to learn in this country as well. Um, so, and there's hope on the way in, in the U.S. Um, that uh, the, the things have really progressed in the last few years with Obamacare now in Washington State, just across the border. Now, for the first time ever, nearly all Washingtonians have access to affordable health care. They're insured. It's a, it's a remarkable achievement with the Obamacare, and let's hope that that stays. But it's a dizzying complexity of, of, of how this operates, and this is just a comparison with between uh, the U.S. complexity of healthcare financing and what's in Canada, and I would not want uh, that, uh, that dizzying complexity. If I, were, if I were trying to design it, I'd be much more on the other camp. But under the surface of it, actually, things in, in this country are actually co complex, uh, hard to navigate for patients, often not patient-centeredness, and lots of things fall through the cracks. Um, this is just a, an example of, in the U.S., about, uh, about that bloatedness. Um, this is a very nice study that was published last or two years ago in, in JAMA by Don Berwick and, and, and Hockbarth, uh, really calculating the amount of waste in U.S. healthcare. Um, 
and it's really becoming a problem in the u s. because it is actually interfering substantially with what the u s. government and state governments can do and it is really affecting business in the u s. so it is it is really threatening the sustainability of of many things um, and berwick and hackberth in their study estimate anywhere between twenty and forty percent of every health care dollar spent is waste um, um, adding no value whatsoever to the end user, be it a patient or the population that they serve, or that they're part of. And it's not only a financial problem, it's an, it's a, it's an ethical problem. Uh, by taking so much of the pot uh, by health care, you squeeze out other resources that probably are more important uh, than health care, education, transportation, uh, social assistance, and the like. Uh, and, but, uh, but, what I think uh, uh, Berwick uh, would, would surmise is e even eliminating a small fraction, a small fraction of this waste would stabilize this, uh, the system anywhere about 4% per year uh, without the drastic cuts that are coming uh, the U.S. way in terms of care and coverage that are likely going to be the result if that waste is not eliminated. So there's huge demands for learning in the U.S. to really, really uh, pump it up and, and actually improve the triple aims, and it's urgent. And uh, many people are proposing that the learning healthcare system uh, has a real play, part to play in this. Systems that deliver care in the U.S. can we uh, uh, learn more rapidly to be less costly, uh, more patient-centered, and deliver reliable quality um, uh, every time. Okay. Um, the the the, the, here is my next, the plan for the next uh, 40 minutes or so. It's really to, to describe the, the concept of the learning healthcare system and really um, the vision for it. And we're a long way from where it is right now. Uh, and then I'll describe two case studies that I have uh, personal experience around the healthcare system that I work in. And I do research in and I try to foster along the way. And that's Group Health Cooperative in Seattle and in the rest of Washington State. It's a, big, it's a big lumbering system, not unlike the lumbering systems here, uh, that it tries to learn. Uh, and then finally, I want to talk a little bit about our learnings and how we may go forward. Um, so so the, the idea of the learning healthcare system was really conceptualized in 2008 by this really landmark report. And if you haven't read this, uh, I'd suggest you do. It came out by the Institute of Medicine. Uh, and it, it is the, uh, from their roundtable on evidence-based medicine. Uh, and, and it really has been a landmark report in the U.S., much like other Institute of Medicine reports have been in the, in the like, two eras, human and crossing the quality chasm. This is next in a series. Um, and they identified some really core problems um, in this. First, and we just talked about it a little bit, is that care that is important is often not delivered. So there's gaps and things that we know work that aren't done. And then there's care that's often delivered that's really not important at all and adds no value whatsoever. Second, that evidence uptake is very slow, uh, very slow. Uh, the diffusion, Rogers diffusion uh, curve is, 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 is um, incredibly slow in picking it up. And it is actually often very unavailable to people who make decisions every day, okay? to providers providing the care and to patients uh, receiving the care. It's not available to them in any easy way. Second is that the evidence really doesn't account for, um, uh, for uh, individual variation in, in need. So evidence that's needed for patients sitting in front of physicians is actually not even there. Um, the trials have not been done on these complex patients they're seeing. And we have to make guesses as to what, what would work for these people. Um, and, the, and I think probably most damning is that the day-to-day -day care experiences of every patient, every day receiving care, are not used to generate evidence. Not used to generate evidence. Okay? So this is a critique not only about health care. It's really about the generation of evidence and research. Okay. Um, they surmise, the Institute of Medicine surmises that, that research is often too far removed from day-to-day -day care. 
um, that it, it is conducted in universities, in academic medical centers, in places that uh, bear, have very little semblance to where care is delivered every day to most patients. And that they really clash as well as the, the, the limits of the evidence that is actually produced, um, including the randomized control trial that leave too many people out and, and really little evidence to guide their care. So the IOM called for a really new research paradigm completely uh, in rethinking this. And, and this has really stirred the pot. Um, and, and a really new relationship between care and research that is really embedding, embedding research right into day-to-day -day care delivery. Okay. Um, and this is actually now possible, possible because of the rapid advances in health IT that we've seen in the remarkable year, in the last few years, where data is now available on every patient with every care experience. To, to generate this. Um, granular data about healthcare right now is everywhere. EMRs have generating data all over the place. Um, patient care data, biometrics, laboratory data, encounter data, operations data, who does what, where, and how to patients is available through electronic systems to, 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 to use. Um, even free text that was used to be completely segmented and you'd have to do manual chart review uh, to try to pull out those free texts, is now digestible with natural language processing to create structured data from free text notes that physicians and nurses write every day. Those data are available um, and can be used. Uh, other industries would use those data. Um, places, places like Pop Data BC have, were really, have been really the early vanguards in the notion of big data in healthcare but they really don't touch the, the, the complexity and array of data that are now available uh, in, most, in many healthcare systems. The learning healthcare system also takes advantage of the heterogeneities that exist among populations and patients and settings and tries to learn from those, those, those heterogeneities in care in patients rather than eliminating them like the randomized controlled trial is. Oh, well, this person uh, can't, we, we shouldn't include them because they're, um, they're, 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 uh, they're outside of our exclusion criteria. Right? Now we can actually learn uh, how care is delivered to those people. Um, and the IOM actually went on even a little bit further and called for the merging of research and quality, continuous quality improvement. A really daring concept uh, for those that work in both fields that are often quite segmented in our institutions. The quality department around improving quality works over quite, quite disjointed from the research setting. And then the IOM really envisioned that the patients and families uh, were really catalysts uh, for the change that needs to happen. And it's funny, you know, and I don't know what it's like uh, nowadays in BC, but, but our patients often think that their care experiences do matter, and they should be used, and we should learn from them. Okay? Uh, and the patient safety uh, world, patients um, are often really, really want mishaps that happen in their care to be used to prevent mishaps that happen to other people. Um, so, it, it, you know, it, it's a bit of a flip that patients aren't interested in improvement. I would argue that they actually are. So, so this is our current framework, our current framework for how research or informs care and vice versa. It's very limited, linear, very linear, and there are many, many opportunities lost here for learning. Okay. On the left side, because, because research is rather distant from day-to-day -day care, uh, clinical work, problems are often misspecified. Okay? They're not really crystallized in terms of the real problems that managers and patients are facing uh, in day-to-day -day, day -day care. And I've had many, many managers and policymakers come up to me over the course of the last few years and say, you know, I love your research. It's really good. It just is not, answer, ask, it's not answering the right question. If it only had been tilted um, and to answer questions that are more real, real to us, it would be much more useful. And then when research is produced, the insights are actually poorly managed. 
um, and often misinterpreted. Uh, 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 evidence from one area is taken and misapplied to other places. Uh, and then when evidence is interpreted correctly, evidence is not reliably implemented. And there are many, many misses here, uh, with many uh, falls here, both in things that should be done and things that shouldn't be done. And then finally, and I would argue the most important, is the experience about how everyday patients experience care is not captured. And when it is captured, it isn't used to generate more evidence. So the IOM, uh, their conclusion was the prevailing pr approach to generating evidence is inadequate today and may be irrelevant tomorrow given the pace and complexity of change. And I think that's a, probably a fair statement. Uh, and it really does uh, stretch the notion of what research should be doing. This is my um, interpretation of really how the different roles occur in healthcare. Um, and it's no doubt that things are poorly integrated with many misses at the research operations interface. Research is done by scientists, pretty far removed from improvement that's done often by cl clinical improvement specialists, often very removed from clinicians who provide care and managers who try to manage the system and then policymakers who are trying to do resource allocation. Those are very often very siloed uh, with very little interaction uh, among the different key players in this enterprise of learning. And then the most remarkable thing is that patients and families are often left out of the loop entirely on this. Um, that uh, that their, their experiences with care are neglected. We don't measure or act on the outcomes that matter. Pretty damning. Okay. So, and this is actually in stark contrast to many other industries. Stark contrast with other industries more. Um, other industries um, such as the auto industry, forestry, um, uh, banking industry even, um, they maximize the, the use of internal data uh, to continually make products better, safer, and cheaper with a focus on the con consumer. This is their mission. Right? And, and there are many examples, and I just have to have a few of them. The retail sector exploits the use of day-to-day -day operations data around who buys what and how it's done, who hits their websites, um, to develop in better ways to match supply with demand at the individual store level, the individual shelf level, uh, and company-wide. Safeway does every day. Okay. Um, the aviation industry um, systematically um, contributes and pools across all the competitive airlines data daily about outcome and process data that can help improve safety management. So this competitive environment in airline industry is able to do learning consistently. And I like this statement by Mike McGinnis, virtually all corporate CEOs speak of the centrality of continuous learning to their efficiency and effectiveness, even to their own survival. Why isn't this like this in healthcare? So this is what the IOM um, um, suggested as, a, as a, um, a, a concept moving forward in the learning healthcare system. And this is how their definition is. The learning system is one in which progress in science, informatics, and care culture align to generate new, logic, new knowledge as an ongoing natural byproduct of the care experience. <coughs> and seamlessly refines and delivers the best practices for continuous improvement in health and health care. A natural byproduct of the care experience. Okay. And just think of this term seamless. And I want you to sit back and imagine a, a little bit and imagine um, a day when the boundaries between health services and clinical research, care and management disappear. This is what seamless means. Right? When all care experience that <coughs> patients get in the care system contribute to the big data body of evidence, where evidence is available across the heterogeneities of patients' needs and care settings that they receive care. Um, if you're pooling that major amounts of big data, you should be able to do this. Figure out what, what matters to particular patients. 
and that when patients, clinicians, and managers would both be the creators and the consumers of the latest evidence on effectiveness and efficiency. That's what the vision of the Institute of Medicine Learning Healthcare System is. It's a pretty bold decision. Is this just pie in the sky thinking? Or really, is it a foreseeable future? Could we see getting there at some point in the future? And we're a long way from there right now. So there's, the, the, I don't have to tell you what the, the challenges here are. The challenges here are enormous. And, and these are some of them that are, I, I would posit, and others have posited as being really important ones. First is really strong leadership in this area that supports with explicit learning and quality improvement goals. Okay? Here's where we are, this is what we want to, how we want to learn, and this is how we want to improve. Okay? The avail availability and aggregation of EMR, PROM, management data uh, into large data uh, warehouses that can be mined uh, for research purposes. It really creates um, huge methodologic challenges for the health services researchers in the audience, uh, uh, much uh, more complex than uh, that we've faced in the past, where approaches to evaluate evidence and exploit heterogeneity in complex systems that are in, in rapid state of flux is needed. So we need new methods and we need improved methods to use this. We need the wide availability of integrated decision support tools that help providers, help managers, help decision makers at the point of those decisions make informed decisions. Uh, we have to address the ethics concerns and the regulatory oversight on this. No doubt about that. Um, uh, we have to establish adequate governance uh, mechanisms and privacy protections around uh, use of these data for both quality improvement and, and research. Um, and we actually have to have, have realistic mechanisms to prioritize where the learning, where the learning opportunities are and we're going to put our, our, our focus on. And the ministry's um, uh, 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 priority setting is a, is a great uh, start to that. And we need to build the infra infrastructure and, and establish sustainable funding streams to do those. And you know, most of these are technical challenges. Um, and technical challenges we can work on and we can, we can solve many of these things. This might be a little bit more difficult to solve. And it's really developing a culture of learning across stakeholders. A real cultural transformation needs to occur about this. And this is the world that, that I live in all, 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 all the time. Um, and it's really uh, just a, a talk, in my experience, the collaboration between research and leaders and users of information is often not easy. We operate in different um, cultures, have different frames of reference, and have different needs. And some of these are the important, um, important areas of friction, but I haven't got them all here. Uh, leaders and managers and clinicians need to solve operational problems. Um, and that's where their questions comes from often, is the, is the problem or the issue that's facing them in the front. And that's, that's where um, what identifies what's important. Uh, leaders or researchers are often focused on theory and past evidence to form uh, research questions. Um, so they're not as operationally focused. Leaders often want um, straightforward answers. But as researchers, we often provide them with complex, new, nuanced answers that often just frustrate them. Okay. Well, you know, you can interpret this way, but be careful of this, and it be, can be confounded by this, and I can't really tell you what a good answer is on this. Okay. Have you heard that before? Yeah. Um, um, researchers often want an uncontaminated comparison group. Um, Leaders often desire whole system change. Um, and holding actually one uncontaminated group is really a problem. A control group is really a problem for often leaders um, because uh, you, you, it's hard to hold a group of patients and providers still while other people, other people improve. Okay? Um, and then lastly, um, um, you know, researchers are often um, uh, don't want to give an answer until it's the final answer. And so we avoid preliminary findings. We avoid giving uh, everything until five years after the paper comes out. Um, and, and often um, those, the, the leaders really want rapid, good enough answers. Um, and, leaders find, uh, and leaders and managers find that final answers, by the time they're actually produced, are irrelevant because things have changed so much by that time. So these are some of the cultural divides that we really have to work through 
And, and it, I, I think you can, but it really has to recognize the needs of both parties and really make compromise and some trust up in place. And, and this is an interface that I work with every day, and we've made some substantial progress uh, around, these, around this. So where do we start if we've got a long way to go? Um, I'm going to give you two examples uh, from Group Health, uh, uh, and there's many I can tell you, uh, but these are two examples that I thought I would, uh, would start with. And first, uh, first, I should tell you a little bit about Group Health. Um, how many of you have heard of Group Health Cooperative before? There's a few. Okay. So, so it's actually very close to here. <laughs> it's just across the border. Um, and it's a, it's a fairly large uh, healthcare system, serves about 600,000 patients, uh, everyday patients, everyday patients, Walmart shoppers, um, uh, Boeing executives, uh, machinists at, at, um, um, uh, at, uh, at, uh, in, in, in Boeing, or, or Amazon, people that work at Amazon. Um, its origins are as a healthcare cooperative, and it started in 1946. So just post-war, it grew out of the cooperative movement in this country and in, 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 in the US. And it, it has two functions. It really delivers both insurance and care, and it marries the two of them together. So in that respect, it's much like Kaiser Permanente or, um, or uh, um, health partners or some of the other large integrated delivery systems. Um, and most of its care is provided um, uh, in a multi-specialty group practice, physician group practice. Of, there's about 1,000 of us, and I'm one of them, um, and delivered across 25 medical centers across the state of Washington, uh, seven specialty centers, one hospital, and then we have a contracted network with a whole variety of patients because we can't do everything for everybody and we have to contract out some services. Um, and it has a, has a research institute attached to it that's been in existence now for about 40 years um, with about 60 scientists. And it's really the public domain, public interest research group that derives, um, uh, it's grant funded for the most part and derives its, uh, its uh, uh, relevance for its partnership through group, with group health. So, so this is a, a, a schematic that um, we developed at Group Health a couple of years ago, really as a practical model, a practical model um, about um, how we might envision research intersecting with the big lumbering um, uh, Group Health Cooperative with 10,000 employees delivering all types of care. Um, and it's still a long way from the intimate perspectives of the Institute of Medicine, but I believe it's a, it's a good step in moving in that direction. And it's based on the rich electronic uh, data sources that Group Health has. Group Health has been fully electronic since 2003 with all care delivery data now in electronic medical record and available for research. And operations, and operations data now that can be married right into that uh, in real time. Um, and the practical model really outlines six intersections between research and leaders uh, that are our focus for learning. Um, and just let's walk through it really quickly. First is surveillance. So research really has a role here in detecting problems. Okay? Um, it helps clarify problems and identify issues and problems that were, had not been apparent before in the health system um, that can bring things to bear. So an example at the Research Institute at Group Health recently were um, uh, the, the Research Institute identified a growing and alarming prevalence of chronic opioid use and, and bad outcomes that were happening to patients because of chronic opioid use, and we published that recently. Another example was the growing use of high-end imaging, and that wasn't surprising, but the radiation exposure that we were exposing patients to uh, was surprising, the amount of patient radiation that was actually coming uh, from high-end imaging. Uh, and both of those type of examples are now leading to substantial improvement work around limiting the exposure to patients to those hazards. Um, but the Research Institute can also help identify research evidence from promising interventions to solve problems, um, uh, like you know, no novel ways of doing shared care, or uh, most recently, um, open notes, so letting patients uh, get right into their progress notes and be able to see exactly what their physicians are, 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 are writing. 
as a way to more engage them. Um, so that's the surveillance function that I think is important. The second is, is um, bringing evidence to base on the design, uh, on health system designer policy. And this is often thought of as knowledge translation. Um, and it's really the synthesis of the available uh, literature about what's known to work, what's not known, what's known not to work, and to then to contextualize the potential solutions to meet the realities of the environment that it's going to be placed in. Okay. Um, and, and healthcare is not just a series of individual little um, things. You put them together often in a multifactorial way. So they're often multi-component interventions that you package together uh, to, to, to refine. Um, and you have to do it in the context of what's really available in the real business of healthcare. The staff that's available, the nurses who work there, um, the resources that are available, the finances, the training uh, um, availabilities for staff in the system, um, and any implementation strategies that the system used for quality improvement. You have to embed it within the current framework of, of what's moving forward. So that's the design component. Third is the implementation component. Um, and really, um, this is where I think we have a lot to help health systems researchers do, is really trying to bring the science of implementation to bear um, in, in improving um, uh, the uptake the, uh, of, of, of interventions. Um, the, 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 the science of implementation is rapidly emerging, and we should be using this much more uh, to make sure that we have reliable, reliable systems to provide um, care that we know works. Um, and the failure, the failure of many innovations or many uh, new strategies is not the innovation per se, it's really the failure of execution. I think you know that. Third is evaluation. So research can really help with real-time evaluation in healthcare, um, and um, uh, another traditional focus for research. But but it's different than what we typically would do. Um, rather than using traditional uh, experimental designs, um, more emphasis is needed around novel ways to assess uh, uh, assess um, and evaluate cluster randomized design, practical control trials, quasi-experimental designs, uh, strong observational models like, uh, um, like interrupted time series, and really actually uh, mathematical statistical modeling to look at probabilities of certain things happening, uh, borrowing many of the principles from industrial engineering into the mix here. Um, these quantitative methods can really tell you uh, whether something works or doesn't, and for whom, and in what setting. But that's not all you need to know in healthcare, whether it just works or not. You really actually have to know a little bit more than that. You need to know why. Okay? And this is where qualitative research really can add, the, add value, um, to really get under the hood as to why didn't that nursing intervention work. Um, and it's very valuable. So I, I'm a big proponent of mixed methods research um, to, to round out the learning sphere here. Finally, um, adjustment. Um, uh, taking, taking research findings from evaluation and then modifying the interventions or the innovations that are needed um, and rapidly improve them on a, on a rapid iterative fashion. Um, and this is where there's tremendous overlap with quality improvement okay, in this sphere. But research and quality improvement actually should go hand in hand in here. And then finally, it's dissemination. And this is where the public good comes through, actually. This is where public good. And it's to, to disseminate internally and externally traditional audiences in gray literature. Um, in my job, I found that actually healthcare leaders don't read published manuscripts. Um, maybe health affairs occasionally. Uh, but they really do focus. They have a tremendous uh, network. Of, 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 of learning resources that they use, and we have to actually use those, those network of resources. So let me just show you a couple examples. I'm gonna just walk through really quickly I'm an example on primary care redesign and then a recent example on shared decision making around learning that we've done. So first was uh, the, the, the patient-centered medical home or primary care redesign, and this is work that I've done, and we've been collaborating in a partnership way with Group Health Cooperative between 2006 and 2014. 
And the partnerships have spanned now that entire learning cycle, the entire learning cycle, um, and continue. So surveillance, quantifying the problems, uh, designing a pro prototype based on uh, rapid evidence synthesis, evaluating the prototype with, with, with metrics that were salient to the health leaders at the time, uh, redesigning based on what we found and try to bring uh, in, uh, evidence of implementation science to bear in terms of planning a, planning a spread of the innovation, um, and then ongoing redevelopments based on the new evidences emerging in the country around the patient-centered medical home, as well as our internal evidence. So, um, and it really has uh, produced some of the first and most robust empirical evidence to date on the benefits of uh, the medical home in the U.S. Uh, currently is the internal work of group health. Um, and it's really served as a model for our evolving uh, healthcare system. So we've now based this, uh, this interactions with group health on many of the other things that we're currently doing. So just some examples of defining the deteriorating primary care performance. Uh, these are just three manuscripts that we wrote uh, at group health's behalf um, to try to understand. And we documented losses of efficiency, uh, decrease in quality performance, burnout and decreasing pa pa patient satisfaction that was a problem for group health and needed to be needed to be worked on and clarified. And this is just an example of some evidence that we produced for group health um, on its health system performance in 2005 um, or six. And you can see what was happening uh, around um, uh, uh, a variety of uh, imp uh, access and efficiency reforms that were put into place between 2000 and 2003 in primary care with huge spillover effects in the emergency room and inpatient admits, inpatient days following this. This is not a recipe for success for any healthcare system that has to control a budget. Right? So some, this, this evidence and much of the other evidence uh, said that something needed to happen in primary care. Um, so we participated with Group Health in, in designing a prototype, bringing evidence to bear in developing a, a brand new thinking about how we might deliver primary care in that, in that clinic and constructed a complex multi-component thing uh, with many uh, structural changes to the, 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 um, the delivery of primary care and many changes to workflow and management that accompanied them. Uh, in collaboration between the operations leaders, the clinicians, and the researchers in the room. Um, so just some examples. Uh, really uh, uh, reduced the panel sizes for doctors to give them more time. Uh, uh, constructed more uh, longer appointments. Expanding clinical teams. Introducing desktop medicine time to deal with email. Uh, and really, really leveraging the EMR and the secure uh, email that was available to group health. And then the care, the care team made a huge amount of changes uh, to the way they delivered care, both at the point of care, outreach, and a variety of management and payment uh, reforms that were also uh, believed to, 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 to help with, with um, care. And we participated in this learning as to construct this multi-component uh, system redesign. Um, and. Um, we had provided some good learnings for group health around this, and we we're actually able to publish them. Uh, so these are the papers that came out in 2009 and 2010, uh, really showing it was a bit of a home run for group health. Um, we could improve patient experience, reduce staff burnout, reduce utilization of ER visits, um, and significantly uh, lower costs within two years to create a, a return on investment for the investments uh, uh, that was needed in that, in that medical home redesign. But then we invented it in one clinic, produced some results. So then what do you do? We got 26 other clinics. So um, were the results generalizable to these other places? What will happen if the other clinics don't invent and redo it and you're just thrusting it on them? How would you spread it? How would you stage it? Um, and are the leaders and managers up to the task of actually leading this profound change in the, in the primary care redesign in the system? Um, and we participated with group health around dis 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 dissecting the intervention, compartmentalizing it, taking the, the evidence around implementation science to bear in thinking, making things simple, letting them adapt it at the, at the periphery, um, and, and, and then using a, an evidence-based approach to implementation, which was lean that we did. 
So I, I'm not going to go through all these modules, but it was constructed in four different modules. These modules were floated through the clinics individually over time uh, through the learnings in the original pilot about how what was successful around uptake here. And this was published last year. It was the effects of spreading a, a medical home system-wide, and this is actually what happened. We substantially changed the delivery of primary care um, uh, with much, much more use of email, uh, uh, and much, much more use of the phone, uh, which is what our patients actually wanted. They didn't want to be forced to come in uh, to the clinics um, uh, and have face-to-face -face visits. Um, and then these are just some of the outcomes that we found. We were able to reduce um, emergency room visits uh, about the same as we did in the pilot um, uh, across the whole system. Where we didn't, weren't so successful was in the inpatient admission rates. We weren't able to, to, to deflect inpatient admissions. It's a question, why? What can we learn from this failure as opposed to uh, what we've done before? Um, and, and we did a lot of learning and dissecting, and I just showed you some of the evidence here, but now these are the new modifications based on the learnings there, placed on the other learnings across the country around readapting and reevaluating the medical home improvement based on risk stratification, care team functioning, changes to staffing models, integrating mental health, uh, chemical dependency, and really developing a community liaison role, parts that weren't part of the original design. And, and we're evaluating every one of these uh, in, in some sort of a systematic way currently. With actually federal funding, the last, the, the one on the patient's uh, community liaison role, we were able to get money from uh, PCORI to study this. So that's one example. Let's go quickly through the second example and then I'm gonna wrap up um, around shared decision making. Um, so we use the model of the learning healthcare system that we developed in the medical home now as a way to uh, move ahead with shared decision making. And just so that to keep the even keel in the room, um, the Dartmouth Atlas, and many people know the Dartmouth Atlas, have shown widespread uh, geographic variation across the use of, of, in, of elected surgical procedures. Right? So patients in Wenatchee, Washington, which isn't too far from here, um, are three times more likely to have their arthritic knees replaced than similar patients in Honolulu. Kaiser Permanente. Why is that? No difference in need. Men in Bellevue, Washington are much, much less likely uh, than those in Thousand Oaks, California to undergo surgery for BPA. Similar, uh, similar income levels, but much less likely. Why is that? This reflects often the variation in physician training, culture, and experience, not what patients need and want. So this is just an example of some of the uh, variation that we found within group health, within our own healthcare system. So we developed, uh, we looked uh, in uh, uh, around the variability in the different um, parts of the, the state, um, uh, King County, the other Puget Sound counties, Central Washington, and the east side in Spokane. And you'll see substantial variability in the use of uh, ex uh, agent sex adjusted knee rates, even though that our surgeons all work for the same company, all are salaried, huge variations internally with group health in, in the delivery of knee replacement surgery. So um, in 2009, group health launched a system-wide uh, shared decision-making initiative based on this, these findings. And they partnered with researchers, I didn't do this, David Arterburn from our research institute really helped to design and evaluate an implementation strategy for shared system uh, decision making that, that wasn't um, just a pilot, but was actually system wide across all patients in group health receiving these, these services. Um, and using uh, tw 12 video decision aids that were systematically disseminated to all patients uh, indicating for, for these procedures, orthopedic, cardiac, urology, women's health, breast cancer programs, and back pro care programs. If they were eligible for these procedures, they were mailed shared decision-making videos to watch before they had a, a, a discussion with the surgeon. Um, and then the surgeons were trained um, around how to have discussions with patients around the shared decision-making materials. Um, but I just want to back up a little bit. This happened in 2009. Hmm, 
group health had actually published a lot of work already on shared decision making. ed wagner published some of the landmark studies of shared decision making back in the nineteen ninety s um that showed that shared decision making in a study at group health improved patient satisfaction and substantially reduced the utilization of those procedures. but there was no mechanism for uptake of that study within our own health care system. so the 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 sir the study worked in parallel to the health care system. interesting. and i'm sure you have examples of this too everywhere. Um, so this is now the reality of shared decision making. This was a study that came out last year in Health Affairs uh, talking about the introduction of these shared decision making videos system wide now for, for uh, knee and hip replacement. And the, and the conclusions are the introduction of decision made with, was associated with a 26% fewer hip replacement surgeries, 38% fewer new knee replacement and 12 to 20, between 12 and 21 percent lower costs over just six months. Um, and patients and physicians were satisfied with this. This was a win uh, and a learning for group health. Um, it's not consistent across all the shared decision-making uh, videos. Uh, so the learnings are individual and we have to learn from all of the different approaches that are being taken. Uh, but large, the results from this implementation suggested that large-scale implementation of patients' decision aids is feasible. Um, and I'm not sure there's any other system in the country that's done as big an implementation of shared decision-making uh, efforts as group health has. Um, it improves patient satisfaction, is generally well accepted by providers, offers potential, and this is important for a place like group health, for liability protection. Um, appears to lower uh, elective rates of surgery and is, is the costs um, are um, reduced or at least cost neutral across all the uh, shared decision making. So this was good learning that happened. So those are my two examples. And, and then I'll just, I'll just tidy up here for a minute and give you some final thoughts about the learning healthcare system <laughs> uh, that we've tried to start uh, this process. And you can see we're a long way uh, from what the IOM was envisioning. Um, so what we've learned to date is that research can actually be embedded in healthcare in real time okay, for needs of decision makers at the times that the, the, the decisions are being made. The research can produce two important things. It can produce data that's, in, that's used for operational uh, decisions. Okay, and it can produce evidence for the public domain at the same time. Okay. Second is that we can work around cultural competence on this uh, research operations interface. Uh, it's necessary and get, that it can be built. And then finally, uh, there are many, many prickly issues, funding, informatics, ethics, privacy, all of those issues that we work through individually, case by case, and, we, and they're not impossible to solve. Um, here's where we have yet to learn here. One is we, we have yet to exploit really the big data resources that are available at Group Health uh, to, to really look um, and leverage the heterogeneities and all the different people that receive these in, innovations. We haven't captured enough patient reported information and patient experience yet. So we have information gaps that we need to fill. Um, and we have yet to figure out how to really systematically capture and account for co-intervention effects and changes in fidelity of interventions that are actually in place. Um, this takes re really, really uh, rich operational data to understand other things that are going in, on in these complex systems. And then really, how to move much more rapidly. 2006 to 2014 is a pretty long time, but uh, for us it was actually pretty short. So that's where I'm going to end, and, um, and I hope you uh, enjoyed that. I'd like to first thank Rob for taking, taking questions. And I have one question to start with. So when we talk about a learning health system, I think it could probably be an innovative health system. Innovation is probably one of the most overused words these days, but I could see everything you're talking about could also be described as innovation. So in Canada, 
I think it's probably comes up almost in every conversation every day. The federal government has an innovation panel ongoing right now as we speak, the Ambrose Committee, which has asked for five. What can the federal government do? Give us five answers what we can do to improve health efficiency across the country. Now, with, with the understanding that the federal government doesn't actually provide health care. Um, so that's one instance. And I, my understanding is they will be in Vancouver before the end of the new year to take submissions. And online submissions end November 15th, I think it is. And I think the example that you've talked about exactly what they're looking for are some of the answers. So I'm going to take one of Sterling's questions. <laughs> from, okay. Okay. Is, that is, innovation, many innovations, I think it sort of implies, is going to cost us more money. Maybe the outcomes will, come, will cost us more money. So the question is, is how have you approached adding the question of how do you add value to the innovation before you actually start the innovation process? How do you look at value? Will this provide value to the health system, whether it's to the patient, to the, to the system, or to the budget? Yeah. Is, that, is that part that's of your consideration? Question. Yeah. yeah that's, that's, so sorry, Sterling, if that was what you were going to ask. Yeah, that's a, that's a great, <laughs> great question. I agree with you. Innovation is a hard word to define, and people talk about it in different ways. Um, and often it is actually quite divorced from research. It is about building things. It's about disrupting entire systems with big changes. It's not about incrementalism in many respects. So it's a, it's a difficult word to use. But, um, but uh, you know, I think you're right. Innovation, um, and this, this is certainly in, in the U.S., innovation historically has produced things that cause, cost money. And, and, and particularly in the pharmaceutical industry and particularly in some of the device and uh, device uh, trials, uh, many things uh, produce costs uh, and, and, and don't help uh, this. So, so we do actually have a very, um, a very structured process around, um, around evaluating ideas for change and, and, and a really structured process around how it meets the triple aim of affordability is really important, um, uh, uh, and, and, and you know, it's a complete success in my mind if you can deliver the same quality at a much more affordable price. That's a good innovation if you can figure this way out. Um, uh, and, then, and then patient experience and, and quality are kind of the metric. Um, it's fascinating how if you think about innovation in any other place than healthcare, what does innovation produce? It produces things that are better and cheaper. Just think about your phones or, or, um, or your computers. Remember how expensive they were and how they didn't work so well? Now they're a lot less expensive and work really a lot better. <laughs> but, 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 um, but, it, but innovation in most industries produces more value. Uh, and particularly around affordability. And it's fascinating in healthcare that that's actually not historically been the truth. Now, questions from the floor or from the, from the stands? Anne? Well, one of the cultural barriers that's been identified in the academic world That's a, that's a fabulous question. And, and in some respects, I don't have to worry about it because I don't work at a university. Right? <laughs> and, and we do value research, but the, the value of that research, if you look at the mission of the Research Institute at Group Health Cooperative, the mission is to, to improve health care and health. It's not to produce research. Okay? It is actually to get to the next stage and actually improve health and health care. Um, you know, the, the, the biggest barrier, the big barrier in my mind, 
um, and, and I, but I think universities could come around to that. And there are many places that are actually moving in that direction. I was just uh, at the University of New Mexico uh, around their transitions and how they're helping their communities, right? And they're pro 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 providing um, currency in the academic promotion criteria for how they help their communities learn. So I don't think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's not a, it, a technical challenge. You can actually do that if you want. Um, but, but I think one of the main problems has been the academic community in terms of valuing this uh, type of messy research uh, by grant funding agencies and by peer review panels and the such. And, and that's a struggle. Um, but things are turning the tide in the U.S. And you, you only have to listen to the, new, the, the head of the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality and Nibakori that I think they're under the gun to produce research that changes people's care and improves things. So they're much more interested at, 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 de at, at funding demonstrations, at funding uh, significant redesigns and partnerships. They now want you to show stakeholder engagement and they want you to have patients at the table as these move forward. So the funding environment is changing and is more supportive now of these of these types of things. So, so that's very, that would relate exactly what we have from the CIHR and the provincial ministries is a strategy on patient oriented research is really to implement your research. But at the same time, it's causing huge tension in the research community of, of both supporting the idea and then also saying, well, who, which funds, I think yesterday was, you're going to transfer funds to do this, it's going to leave less money for, for traditional research. I think that's probably, I'm not sure if it's worldwide, but certainly across the country. How do you convince the funders, such as federal governments, that to be able to do both requires increase in research investment? Um, <laughs> Good, we're all looking for an answer. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that, that's not an answer I, I think the U.S. government can provide. I well, mean, if anything, <laughs> everything in, in the U.S. has gone down in terms of research dollars, and it's really more around redirecting uh, dollars within the research budgets to things that are more likely to improve the health of Americans rather than just produce costs with little value. So there, there is a, a very much a tension in uh, NIH and in most of the funding agencies in the U.S. for exactly that reason. So I don't have a solution to you, for you around that. Uh, but I, but I, think, um, I think the voice of people needs to become clearer um, and what they really want. And I think they're becoming more sophisticated about what they're wanting. They're realizing that, that more is not necessarily better that more is hazardous in many respects. And really failures of deli care delivery in terms of gaps of care are really not on anymore. Um, and we really need to figure out how to fill those gaps and do things more reliably and consistency. So I think the tide is turning from at least our patient population of what they want from research now. I have a question uh, about um, your experience around actually collecting patient data uh, post intervention. So uh, people who have had uh, laparoscopic uh, knee surgery or uh, post-surgical pain uh, as an outcome. How is that captured somehow yeah. within your system? So, so I, I'll give you one example, and we're 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 early in this in this field, but the best example we have is uh, depression. And everybody know, probably knows about the PHQ-9, the Sandomized Depression Indice Index that's used to detect for depression and is used to manage depression, to, to treat, to target. Um, that's a questionnaire that's used in healthcare all the time and guides treatment. Um, and it is a very robust research tool that can be used as outcome. Um, so that is actually available at Group Health because it's a systematic process to collect those, those data uh, through the health risk appraisal at all pre-visit work. Those rich, rich questionnaire data around patients' depression and social support is available. And we, we were able to successfully, not me, but one of our, our, our collaborators was successfully able to compete on a new PCORI grant because one of the questions on the PHQ-9 um, is about suicide intentionality, right? That's the last question. 
Um, and now you actually have a database about people, people who are contemplating suicide, okay? So you have a registry of these people that you can intervene with in different ways. So there's a bunch of different um, uh, mechanisms to intervene with around suicide. And there's a practical control on right now to, to use those data um, uh, to, 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 to both implement um, the practical trial of really fair different ways of doing it. One um, on uh, a behavioral therapy intervention, another one on, um, oh, I, I'm, I'm missing the, I can't remember the, the, the other arm. But, but um, and the outcome is both the depression scores itself that are systematically collected and suicide attempts that are collected from the emergency department. So that was a successful grant at PCORI that is kind of a, 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 a really a good example of exploiting the use of those types of data. No, not a coincidence. Uh, anyway, my question is about uh, the perceptions of the people who work uh, as you introduce this. If people, if you measure whether the people on the front line uh, and the perception about, about what they actually uh, uh, felt that they were learning and, and implementing knowledge was now part of their job as opposed to just doing um, the other things. That's a good question. We didn't formally evaluate that, so I can't give you a specific, I can just give you anecdotal experience around that. Um, the, the, both on both sides of the coin, what it was like for operations people to be partnering with, with, with um, researchers or what it was like for researchers to be par partnering with operations people in this. So on the first one, um, I think, uh, I think the, the value of evidence became clearer to the operations people and the value and the uh, researchers that could help interpret evidence for them uh, was seen as a real win uh, from the operations side. And so they actually really enjoyed working with, um, with the researchers to help them think through how they might evaluate. And uh, you know, a couple of them have gone off now to do MPHs because they got actually very interested in this whole field. So, so I think there was general support on the research side, um, uh, it, I think generally a lot of people like doing this type of research, but it, it takes a certain type of researcher to do this. It's messy. Um, you have to tolerate the uncertainty, the changes, the shifts that are occurring in healthcare, and the practical realities. And it takes special people to do that. I'm, I, it's not all research, researchers that can do this type of work. Yeah, is that's, like that? that is a fabulous question because I think you're quite right. And that's, that's a very important role that researchers can play um, with that to avoid those traps uh, because that, that is the inclination often for managers and clinicians is to quickly go down a rabbit hole that doesn't make any sense. And you really have to hold them back and sort of say that's not right. But that's, that's great. I don't have any explicit ways of doing that, but I think the partnership really helps. Um, congratulations on a very nice framework and environment for the learning. It strikes me that you also have an excellent environment for the flip side, which is unlearning. Um, it's not as trivial as it seems, no. because as you saw in Dr. Strangelove, there are some patterns that are difficult to unlearn. And 
particular introduction of something may actually cause many different learned behaviors and attitudes. So it's not just um, that you're introduced to a difference. It's not just unlearning, but it's also replacement learning, which may have a different um, <coughs> dimensions, all of which need to come together. Now, it may be easier to do in a system that is as well integrated as yours is, but in BC, where physicians are trained solo or in the past, right? Introducing, for example, a TMR requires unlearning the pen, unlearning yeah. writing yeah. something yeah. in you know, one inch yeah. of movement versus yeah. five clicks. Yeah. And there are many, many things about learning which require unlearning, yeah. about which there's very little theory. Maybe in organizational learning, there's some learning about unlearning. I, I, I mean, I, that's a wonderful comment. And I'm going to steal that and put it in the presentation because it's just, <laughs> it's just perfect. And I'm really glad you could do it. You can, you can come up and help me present next time I do this. But um, you know, there, there, there's two dimensions to that I just want to talk about. One is you're absolutely right. There are many things that are not valuable anymore uh, that we really need to lose. Right? And that unlearning trajectory is really, really a challenge. Um, and, and actually, I would suggest that's really, really where leadership and management really can come to bear. Okay? And you really need powerful, credible leaders that can help providers and care communities um, if they want to move ahead with a certain er in a certain area because they see advantages to it. They actually have to give up a bunch of things. Right? They have to actually lose things. And you have to be very explicit about that and, and actually allow for time to grieve. Because many of these are well-intentioned, well long-term behaviors that are very hard to give up. So there, and that is a central challenge around leaders and managers in any health system as people move through change. Cold the, blue, Jim Patterson, second floor. Burns of plastics trauma units. Code blue, Jim Patterson, second floor, BPTU. The, the, the question, I'll add, the last thing I just wanted to say, the question I thought you were going to ask was about how do you sustain things? Um, how do you keep it going? So this medical home stuff, and like, is it going to be there in a few years from now? I don't know. Um, it, it is, it, centrality to this is a, is, a, is a framework for sustainability and really to keep things in place that we know work and we know, uh, we know make them, and, and things disappear very quickly in the hubbub of clinical care and you can't just believe that it becomes part of the DNA and will we'll stay there. You really have to really think through sustainability much more than we have in the past. I think our time is up, so thank you. I'd like to thank you again for your such a stimulating seminar and thoughts that we think we're all involved with on a daily basis.